Greetings from the European Parliament studio in Brussels. My name is Ilza Nagla, and today we will be speaking about climate change, electric cars, and price of electricity, what those things have in common. And today I'm joined uh, by two MEPs from very different angles of European Union. Uh, from Latvia, I'm joined by Nils Ushakovs. Here he represents uh, Socialists and Democrats, a political group here. Good afternoon. Very nice to have you here. And from Portugal, I'm joined by Francisco Guerrero. Yes. And he represents a political group of the Greens. Thank you for having me. I have to ask that uh, during the pandemic, we saw that the uh, emissions went mm -hmm. down. And yep. uh, we can actually t say that the climate change hum sometimes have some unexpected allies. Yep. The current increase of energy price, mm -hmm. how will that affect our fight against the climate change? Will it help or the opposite? Well, first of all, let's put into perspective that even with the year that we had of, of COVID pandemic, where the economy shut down and global economy almost shut down, the level of decrease of the emissions was not far enough so as to, to reach the equilibrium. What am I saying? We have a, a carbon uh, balance on a year and we still uh, reach more or less May or, J or uh, June and we are ending the, 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 the credit that we have for that year. So we are still uh, launching more emissions and we still have a lot of emissions in the air. That's, well, it's like a, de a debit card. So we still have to manage those. So even with the pandemic, the emissions were not sufficient for us to have a, like in one year, the emissions that we should have, like in a regular economy. So pandemic didn't economy. really help that much. It helped in a certain way, but as we are seeing also in the relaunch of the economy, we are emitting more that we should should be doing it. So we didn't learn much from the pandemic, and we are still building build, building up our economy to make it really circular, and really uh, grasping the the mistakes that we did on the energy grid, on the production of, of food, on the transportation, aviation, uh, uh, international trade. So we are still learning from, from those mistakes. But I do think that, for example, on the national plans of uh, recovery, we are not doing enough, even uh, at European level. And we have certain limitations because we are not a federation, so the member states have more than enough power and sometimes the European Union cannot act directly. And so we are not doing enough to really shift to a circular economy, to, to really make the decrease of the emissions that we should be having in 2030, 2050. So we are, we are not doing enough in order to, to become greener, but in the light of the rising energy prices, is that so easy actually? I would love actually to go back to the question about the pandemics and the effect of it on, uh, on our fight uh, with climate changes. I actually believe that pandemics can have really negative effect on ev everything we plan because people within the last two years, well, obviously it depends on the rise from country to country, but people started to act irrationally when they offered or requested to do something really important and actually very simple. I mean, get yourself vaccinated make a jab. I mean, people are getting vaccinated for centuries. It's something like really old. Well, not for centuries, but for decades. No, no, no. no. In general, first uh, uh, vaccines, as they appeared uh, in the 19th century, when I about this. So people right now are acting irrationally. Their rationality is um, sometimes abused, sometimes propelled by certain politicians. So that means when they will face a choice between higher prices <laughs> for electricity, or some requests or uh, other requirements that makes their uh, life uh, more expensive. And potential threats like you say, well, look, it's like in Germany this year, hundreds of people died in floods. It's an argument, but people don't listen to these arguments anymore. But that's what we see. So we have to be extremely careful and extremely uh, um, take into account the bad experience of COVID in different countries, not to fail with the Green Deal and with our fight with climate, because it will be another fight by populists, by uh, politicians who are just acting in selfish a way and we have to take into account. Do you agree that the, the people are uh, pandemic made them tired of such sacrifices and Green Deal asks a sacrifice from, from people? Well, I think that from also businesses? depends from country to country. For example, in Portugal, we have a, a magnificent rate of vaccination. 85% of the population is vaccinated. Uh, we have uh, higher numbers in older vaccination uh, age, like more than 60, is like 95% 
people are vaccinated. So it also depends on the communication, on that effort from moderate parties to communicate science. And so I think we also should learn about that because it is being used by populists to, to undermine the, the, uni, uh, the, the union and also undermine science. And so we also have to be careful when you're talking about green deals. But for example, I think we should uh, be very cautious. Uh, and when we're talking about the transition, the green transition, we should not uh, mistake it uh, to a centralized transition at an energetic level. For example, in Portugal, we have huge price of energy now. Uh, smaller companies that are trading energy are beginning to be, be bankrupt. And so this shows that we are still very dependent on that centralized model. We, we, we work at the uh, Iberian uh, energy market, so it's Spain and Portugal. And so we work together as, as two countries. But we are still very centralized on the production at large scale. We should decentralize the production. We should bet on 100% renewable energy. And we sh should speak clearly to citizens that we are consuming more energy that, than we need on things that probably we don't need. So we have to make shifts on industry, on agriculture, on um, transportation, public transportation, housing. But that also requires that the recovery funds, the recovery programs, the national recovery pro uh, programs also focus on that transition. And for example, in Portugal, we have small parts to that decentralization of, of production of clean energy, but it's not enough. And so if we go towards that uh, transition that is more decentralized to companies, to families, to municipalities, we can cope with these shocks that come mainly from abroad and also by the, mm. the prices that come mainly from the gas industry that are pushing prices up. So, but let's let's go back to the sort of uh, price of electricity going up now and us wanting to live uh, greener. Um, the Commission also talks about the uh, need to switch to electric cars. And at one point in time, the, actually, the internal combustion engine cars will be forbidden in the EU or the new cars will not be built with such engines. But if the electricity price of electricity goes up, it also means that people will have less incentives to to turn to electric cars because they will be expense, more expensive. If electricity prices go up, people in general will not be buying that many cars because they will not have that much money. It will not matter whether it will be diesel or electrical car. You said really co proper way. I mean, it depends from country to country. And it's not a potential dividing line, unfortunately, because what we see right now with vaccination uh, countries, we saw. Uh, let's put it this way, lower uh, GDP per capita are getting uh, also lower uh, vaccination rates. It's not a, uh, academic research results, but that's what we're seeing. And when you will have a choice, eating or hitting, you will not think about uh, changing your diesel for electrical car because you will have to pay for your primary needs. And again, it will be a divide between East and the West. So that's what we see due to absolutely understandable reasons. And then again, I'm going back to what I'm saying. I want my son, he's six years old, to live in a healthy and, and, and safe environment. But I'm a practitioner, so that means that uh, sometimes we'll have to think about the potential fight with populists when you talk about political divide, and what we do with the uh, economical divide between the West and the East, and here, what is crucial, we will see right now uh, uh, energetical crisis, which will result also in social crisis. If European Union Commission, hopefully with the support of the European Parliament, provides instruments and tools for ordinary people to survive this crisis, then we've got much better chances to deal with them about talking how we fight with climate changes. If we fail right now, then we will be failing again and again because there will be populists saying, look, you don't, you're not able to fight with anything. <laughs> so stop talking about Green Deal with us. Let's do something practical. Practical for them is something we really don't like to see implemented. But that's true. People mm. might go out in the streets like we saw a couple of years yep. ago in France with Gillette John with the Yellow Vests. Yep. We, but we, I think also th that depends on the lack of solutions that are being uh, made by the states and also by the European Union. It's not new. It, it seems like we are talking about the, this e uh, energy crisis and climate crisis like it's a thing from now, but it's not. We are, we, the, the science is here for, for decades. And so we, we built this, this problem and now we are trying to get out of it. So the way to get, for us to get out of it is to not talk only about uh, cars because people should really understand that. Uh, individual cars are, are a problem and are uh, very inefficient. So we, we are talking about automatization of cars, that it's a thing from 10 years that people won't need one car or two cars or five cars per family. So we'll have access to cars, not the possession of cars. 
by voluntary choice, it's not mandatory, obviously, but we should be talking about public transportation, massively t public transportation, trains, um, reducing the, the flights uh, internally. We have a lot of things to talk about when we're talking about transportation. But focusing again on energy, we can have a, a practical solution that is uh, helping citizens and companies to have their production of energy. It depends on country to country. Obviously, Portugal has a lot of solar, has a lot of hydric uh, uh, power, and so we have to use those and winds. And probably in in other countries, on east eastern countries, those those, those sources are not available. So also talking about the European uh, market of energy is also important because we can export, we can trade energy that is renewable to other countries. They're not being dependent on Russia, on Morocco, for example, that Portugal is on but gas. Let's, let's yeah. go. You said that we, people have to understand that when it comes to transport, there have to be changes. Yeah. Well, what about changes, let's say, uh, MEPs commuting between Strasbourg and, and, and yeah. Brussels on, on regular basis every month? Well, this month's even two times. Yeah. Should that be given up? For me, yes. Of course. <laughs> of course. And it's, yeah. not, it's not only because of the Green in, Deal. I mean, it's yeah, just, yeah. I mean... Inefficient. <laughs> yes, it's not efficient. I mean, it's, it's important from yeah. political point of view. We understand it's really important that it's France, Germany, Strasbourg. But come on, it's, it's a 21st a century. Best, yeah. mm. But then we are totally in agreement. But the, the Fra France is the one who sort of... France, France disagrees. Yeah. Yeah. France disagrees. <laughs> they have to... We can make a, another solution, so we can set there... It's another debate, but we can set like an university, like a science uh, institute, something that, OK, gives jobs to, to that community and uh, increases the resilience of the economy. But come on. I think we, we, we yeah. should be debating this on a new treaty that it should end. And we... what do you think about this uh, Commission's uh, new Green Deal and Fit for 55? that uh, we need to decrease the emissions uh, by 55% till 2030. Is that enough? Uh, yeah, well, you well, come from green, so you stop. Yeah, for us, obviously, it's not enough. Uh, the science shows that we should be decreasing 65 to 70% until 2030, and obviously trying to reach the neutrality as soon as possible. Obviously, 2050 is a good target. Uh, it's, it's the first continent to set this goal, so obviously we are on a good page, also by the socialists that are, are, are doing this effort. But for us, the Commission is not doing enough, and this Fit for 55 package is also that, that uh, approach that's not doing enough, also on emission trading schemes. Uh, we should also be debating um, how we could end internal combustion engine production by uh, 2023 and not 2032. And so several areas like agriculture, fisheries that are not bu are built in this uh, this 50 to 55 package. But obviously it's uh, it's a good approach. It's a, it's, a, it's a good first step for us to try to debate and try to, to reach a common deal for us to implement the, the Green Deal. So it's enough or too much? It's a reasonable compromise from the implementation point of view. Um, I'm afraid that uh, during the course of uh, these reforms, we will face lots of challenges and we will, have be, uh, we will be fighting not to get below this target. If we see, I would love to see that we are doing better than we plan. Of course, we can uh, uh, adjust our uh, priorities, but I do believe that we will be fighting a lot with populists and others. So uh, achieving this target <coughs> will be a good result. So reasonable compromise, let's put it this way. But just in order to, f to finish uh, today's debate, maybe it's kind of a uh, new completely take on that. Uh, maybe we, sh we can forget about all those our little efforts that come so with uh, such a difficult, hard price for mm -hmm. society and focus more on solar geoengineering. So that could solve our problems. And what is could it? it? <laughs> I think if we are not able to, to understand that, for example, our individual effort is relevant and that's even at national level, we have huge power to make this transition, hoping that some technological new approach will solve the problem, well, I think it's the wrong way. We should really be thinking about changing the paradigm of consumption, of hyper-consumption, of hyper-externalization uh, of costs, and really talking directly to the citizens, saying, OK, we built this society this way, but we have better in, uh, outcomes if we do th things in another way. And then uh, providing the resources to industry, to, to agriculture, to fishermen, to make those, those, those changes. And obviously, I, I think, uh, well, we can see the youth 
really understands these needs. And so we are tackling several uh, ages. But the youth, for example, is a clear example that they do want this change and they want it uh, made by politicians. And so we should understand... So the solar things. geoengineering, putting something in the cloud so it reflects more solar light away from the Earth, that's not really a solution that we are looking into. The problem is that we are always trying to look at a very technological approach to solve problems that we now have the solutions. We have to decrease consumption of certain goods and certain problems. We have to reform our international trade. We have to rethink our way of producing, distributing and consuming food. And we really have to uh, allocate the money where this transition uh, must go. Uh, agriculture, industry, uh, urban uh, transportation. So we can really decrease um, well the emissions of, of greenhouse Setting uh, reasonable targets and reasonable regulation can motivate companies and private business to spend more on research and development, driving science, and eventually providing us new technological uh, solutions, whatever it is, set that will drive prices down, that will uh, provide better solutions in general for climate uh, fights. So this can be an attempt, actually, to do the proper way that uh, with the regulation we motivate private companies to do something good. So thank you so much for the debate today. So as we just heard, the climate fight against the climate change has many challenges and the rise of the energy prices is just one of them. But that doesn't mean that we have to give up. Thank you so much and bye. Thank you.